All right, so this is all about what shaped the Atlantic colonies. So the Atlantic colonies, meaning the, the ones that are near the Atlantic Ocean here. So Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, uh, those are part of the Atlantic colonies. So have you ever wondered why Canada today is divided into provinces and territories? In 1850, the British North America, or British North America, was made up of separate colonies and territories. The colonies were under the British government's political control and the territories were governed by the British Hudson Bay Company. The Atlantic colonies were Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. The colonies farther inland were Canada East, so present-day Quebec, and Canada West, which is present-day Ontario. The Northwest region and New Caledonia were governed by Hudson's Bay Company. Britain established these colonies and territories on ab Aboriginal lands. As they were established, their ab Aboriginal inhabitants were often dis dis they were displaced. So look at this map and at figure 1.1. How do you think the distances between these territories and colonies affected their relations with each other? So the distance between territories and colonies. So these are the colonies and these are the territories. So how do you think the distance between these territories and colonies affected each other and their relationship? It's probably tough to transport to each other. So this map shows British North America and surrounding areas in 1850. So let's analyze. How strongly connected do you think the people in the Atlantic colonies felt to the rest of British North America? So people way over here, how do you think they felt to the rest of British North America? All right, moving on. So looking here, despite being located in the same region, the colonies of Newfoundland, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick were very different from each other. For example, Newfoundland, Newfoundland was known for its fisheries. Prince Edward Island was known for agriculture. Nova Scotia was known for its shipping and coal mines. Forestry and shipbuilding were an important part of the economy in the Atlantic colonies in the mid-1800s, particularly in New Brunswick. So ships built in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia carried goods throughout the world. So looking at this picture right here, which is a drawing of a lumber mill and shipyard in New Brunswick, what does this drawing tell you about the relationship between forestry and shipbuilding? Well, they definitely had a strong relationship, right? Shipbuilding, the ships moved the lumber and you needed the lumber in order to build the ships and they used that as part of trade. So what details in the image show that shipbuilding was successful in New Brunswick? that it was a successful industry. Building industries and fortunes. Industry was booming in Atlantic colonies in the mid 1800s. There were many opportunities for both working class and middle class people to make a living, but most struggled to get by. However, mer merchants, sh so merchants meaning uh, people that work at shops, merchants, shipbuilders, However, merchants, so people who trade things, shipbuilders and other business people were able to develop successful businesses, which created a wealthy upper class. Joseph Salter was a successful New Brunswick, New Brunswick businessman and politician. And in the 1850s, Salter's shipbuilding company was one of the largest employers in the Atlantic colonies. He was elected as the first mayor of of the town of Moncton in 1855, but as times changed, so too did Salter's career. For example, when the demand for his particular ships dropped suddenly in 1859, he turned to mining. At first, he worked as an executive in a mining company in New Brunswick. Then he moved to Nova Scotia, where the large supply of coal offered more opportunities. Salter became wealthy 
from the many industries that continue to grow in Nova Scotia. So look at figure 1.3, which shows a monument of Salter built by the city of Moncton, New Brunswick in 1990. Why do you think there's a monument depicting Salter rather than his employees? So why would Moncton create a sculpture of Salter on its 100th anniversary? Producing goods. In the mid-1800s, ports in the Atlantic colonies bustled with business activity. In New Brunswick, industries such as lumber, iron, and coal benefited from the shipbuilding industry. Let's look at the painting of Marco Polo. Right here, the Marco Polo was known as the fastest ship in the world. It made a record-breaking trip to Australia in 1852, over 100 years after the ship sank. People were making movies and writing songs about it. What does this tell you about the importance of ships and shipbuilding to the Atlantic colonies? It's definitely a huge part of its development. That's how goods got to British North America from Britain. They would use the ships to trade and get goods, and that created a thriving industry that allowed other industries to thrive and grow. Farming and fishing. The mid 1800s were also an uncertain time for some people living in the Atlantic colonies. For example, PEI had good agricultural resources. However, only about one third of the farmers on the island owned their land. The rest were tenants. So tenants meaning people who rent who paid rent for their landlords to the landlords for use of their land. Violent conflicts sometimes erupted when landlords or their agents tried to remove tenant farmers who fell behind their payments. To make a living in Newfoundland, people fished the rough waters of the North Atlantic. Fishing families were often in debt to wealthy merchants. The merchants controlled the industry by buying the catch and supplying the fishing families and food with food equipment, and other goods. Changing trade relations. So during the first half of the 1800s, most of the goods produced by the Atlantic colonies went to Britain, the United States, the West Indies, and Latin America, rather than to the other British colonies in North America. Economic development and political events gradually changed these trading patterns. The boom in American railway building in the 1850s created a demand for goods from the Atlantic colonies. So in other words, Britain and the United States worked together. They signed a trade agreement called the Reciprocity Treaty. And this agreement allowed free trade, trade between countries with no taxes. And that was very important. Agricultural products and natural resources from British North America and the United States, trade to the United States increased after this treaty. In 1861, the American Civil War broke out in the United States. The war was fought between the northern and the southern states. And you'll learn more about that in Chapter 2. The war created an increased demand for agricultural products, farming products, and other natural resources from the Atlantic colonies. At the end of the war in 1865, the United States and the Reciprocity Treaty. The American began heavily taxing goods from, the British, Nor from British North America. As a result, people in the Atlantic colonies lost a valuable market for their products. So free trade, trade between different countries without taxes or restrictions. So this is very important right here, looking at this little question. How would the cancellation of the Reciprocity Treaty affect relations between the colonies in British North America? So the reciprocity treaty means ta there's no taxation. It's free trade between the United States. So the cancellation of the reciprocity treaty, how would that affect the relations between the two, between North British North America? Okay, so we're going to read about working class children during this time. So... With this question in mind, how are the attitudes about child labor, so child work, 
in the 1800s different from our attitudes toward it today. So unless they came from a very wealthy family, most children in the 1800s had to help their families make a living from an early age. Today, in some parts of Canada, children's chores can still include farming activities. However, in the 1800s, children's work was generally harder and more dangerous than children's work today. As British North America became more industrialized and the demand for goods increased, more children spent their days in dangerous working conditions. Children often did it did the same work as adults, but for lower wages. They would work on farms and in mills, factories, and mines. Britain had laws that protected children in dangerous jobs, such as mining. And by 1842, boys under the age of 10 and all girls were banned from working in mines. The British North American colonies however, did not have such laws. Children as young as seven and eight were often sent to work. Seven and eight years old, that's that's insane. By 1866, there were 449 boys working in coal mines in Nova Scotia, representing almost 15% of the mining force. In New Brunswick, fishing communities like Misco Island, or Miscu Island, Girls as young as 10 worked for low wages, cleaning and preparing the catch for fish merchants. They did this work in addition to the, their chores at home, such as looking after young siblings and cooking. So Martin Butler, born in New Brunswick in 1857 to a working class family, Martin Butler was the youngest of 11 children. Like his siblings and many other children, Martin Butler spent his childhood working and contributing to the family income. The Butlers were farmers, but farming alone could not support the family. Martin's father and brothers were often, they often worked in the lumber industry in the fall and winter. And when the Butlers could no longer find jobs in the lumber industry, they created shingles for roofs from discarded logs. So reading figure 1.7 right here. It's an expert, an excerpt from Martin Butler's recoll recollections of his early childhood. How does Butler help us understand how changes in industry impact the lives of many children in Atlantic colonies? So this is Martin Butler, author and poet. There came still harder times. The two eldest boys, Ephraim and Benjamin, his brothers got discouraged and ran away. Young as we were, we had them we had then to assist in making the living, and many a time have my arms ached from swinging the heavy mallet used for splitting shingles. So how did Butler how did the Butler children feel about working for a living? It's probably very they're very tired, they probably did not like it. Butler left home for the first time at the age of 11 to work for another family as a household servant and store clerk. He paid room and board. Martin Butler is also an unfortunate example of the dangerous conditions of the workplace in the 1800s. At the age of 18, his right arm was caught in a piece of machinery and he lost his arm but survived. He became a poet and printer later in life and continued to work odd jobs to support himself. First Nations loss of territory. In the Atlantic colonies, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing these, I'm not sure, and Passamaquoddy, First Nations, had signed peace and friendship treaties with the British government. These treaties guaranteed Aboriginal rights to hunt and fish throughout the region and to maintain a reasonable livelihood. And at the same time, immigrants from Europe and the United States continued to arrive. They expected cheap and even free land. The government did little to protect the small territories reserved for the First Nations. So read the quote on figure 1.8, and it's a petition from, of Mi'kmaq Chief Noel Briot, Briot to the government. So what is Chief Briot asking for? Your petitioners do not wish any more of the land at Tabosin attack, New Brunswick, sold, but they most especially object to the sale of the marsh. 
without which they will be reduced to extreme poverty. So Chief Noel Briot, First Nation at Burnt Church and Tabasintak. So it's an excerpt from the petition. So why do you think the chief believes the sale of the land will cause ex extreme poverty? Well, where will they go? The government rejected Chief Briot's plea. A commissioner responded that based on the government's observations at the reserve at Burnt Church, First Nations people are not well adapted to become valuable settlers. The colonists benefited from industries that developed on what was once First Nations land. However, they rarely offered jobs to First Nations people to work in these industries. The local First Nations tried to earn a living in different ways. They used their skills to harvest maple syrup, berries, and other wild produce to sell to the colonists. They also made baskets, brooms, and barrels to sell, as shown in figure 1.9. So why do you think colonists did not want to hire First Nations people to work? What do you think? So this painting right here, looking at that painting, shows a group of Maliseet people making baskets to earn money. What examples can you see in this painting of Maliseet people incorporating European customs into their lives? So the hat, what else do you see of European customs, meaning European lifestyle? All right, so here are some check-in questions that you should answer, so evaluate and draw conclusions. Why was the Reciprocity Treaty significant for the Atlantic colonies and a cause and consequence? How did the development of trade and industry affect the lives of First Nations people living in the Atlantic colonies of British North America?